So first, uh, welcome to class. Um, this is the deep unsupervised learning class. Um, it's going to happen every uh, Thursday night from six to eight. Um, as you know from our advertising, uh, this is basically not really an NUS class. It's a study group. So it's meant for all of us to convene together to talk about a lecture that was already pre-recorded on YouTube. Um, this semester, I've chosen to do the deep unsupervised learning uh, based on feedback from all of you who were in the Slack channel before and also from input from my group. All right, so what we're doing is we're watching the, the course from UCD, UC Berkeley, and then um, we are going to take turns to present the material, okay? So um, the details are pretty simple, so I just want to make sure uh, what uh, is going to happen, how does it basically work. Um, so there's two, three classes of participants, which I think you know about. Basically, we have NUS undergraduates. Who here is an NUS undergraduate? One, two, three. Okay, only three. I thought we had 10. So I don't know where everyone else is, so I hope we can find the rest of them. Uh, maybe some of them are online, but I'm not sure about that. It's also not so easy to come with this citation, so maybe not so fine. Okay, so uh, for undergraduates, uh, thanks for participating in this do-it-yourself module. This is the first time that NUS is allowing students to create their own modules in some way, and so with the help of the supervisor, we've decided to offer this. Okay, the important thing about this is that you have to have at least a little bit of understanding of deep learning already. Um, and, and uh, some uh, machine learning background in order to take this course because it's uh, quite heavy on the math, as I understand. Okay, the other part of it is uh, we will have during week three onwards, we will have PhD students from the Department of Computer Science and Department of Information Systems Analytics from the SOC also joining the course. So they, they actually don't know whether they're allocated to this course yet, so they come in week three. Okay. Um, so I don't think we have many uh, PhD students just out of time, right? Anyone else here is a PhD student? Okay, Martin and uh, your name? Uh, 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 your name? Ju uh, Feng Ping. Yeah. Okay. So and uh, I forgot. Devon, Devon, Devon. right? Devon, you. Okay. So you guys are PhD students. If you're first year, you you can take this course for credit as part of the lab rotation, the two credit lab rotation. Uh, for 6101, which is the introduction to computer science. Otherwise, if you're not a first year student and you've already completed it, uh, uh, probably you won't get any full credit. And then finally, we have external participants. Can I hear from all the external participants? Okay, yeah, usually the, we're outnumbered uh, outsiders to NUS. Okay, that's why we, we make it uh, weekday nights and we, we open it up to the public. Okay, so the whole point is to, to get a whole bunch of people from commercial backgrounds or in any other background to come together and study together, okay? And so there are different requirements, so I want to make sure everyone's on board with that, okay? So the first thing is that we have a mandatory discussion group on Slack. So you must have a Slack client and you must be able to uh, get notifications. So uh, when you're uh, mentioned, uh, do pay attention to those. So hopefully you, you get Slack notifications uh, every day from email, but uh, you know, if you have a client on your phone or your your uh, laptop, it will help a little bit, okay? So um, what happens uh, for the requirements, okay? So basically, um, we will be asking each of you to lecture one of the courses and to scribe for one of the courses at a minimum, okay? Students who are undergraduates because they're getting it for four modular credits will have to do this twice, okay? Meaning that in the first half of the semester, that means week uh, two, which is next week, to week six, which is right before recess week, you guys will have to do one of these two functions each time, okay? Meaning maybe week two you present and then week three you scribe, okay? And then in the second half of the semester, you will have to do it again, okay? This is to, to make sure we have enough load uh, spread out all over the place, okay? And external participants and PhD students, because you're not either getting any credit for it or you're getting a reduced number of credit, you only have to do this responsibility one time, okay? So what does it actually mean to present the lecture material, okay? So some of you have been in this class before, they, you know the structure of how it goes, okay? Basically, the first thing you do is you watch the assigned video for that week, right? You try to take notes or whatever, 
And then along with the peers that are assigned in that group, so there'll be a, uh, a group of about two or three of you all working together to present that lecture material, you divide the lecture, okay? So you can say, oh, well, uh, Peter and his PhD students covered uh, 60 slides, let's cut 20, uh, 15, 15, or something like that. In the last couple, we won't do it all, okay? You guys can decide, all right? You, uh, typically what happens is the week before, for example, now it's week one, so the, the team that's presenting for week two will come together at the end of week one's class and decide how to divvy up the slides, okay? And because the slides are already created by Peter, you don't have to do any extra work, but you may. In fact, many of our past students in 6101, what they've done is they did their own slides and then they inserted material from, from Peter's course or other people's course. Why? Because of course, you learn best when you have to teach, right? So if you don't understand certain things in the slides, just leave them out. Isn't that great? You, you're the teacher, you get to decide what to cover, what not to cover, okay? Or if you're not sure and you want to deliberate because this is not a lecture, this is supposed to be a discussion group, right? You put it in there and then you ask the class, hey, I'm completely flabbergasted by this math. I don't understand it. What's going on here? And then let's deliberate because it is a discussion group, okay? This is how I think learning is going to be in the future. There will be people who are very advanced making lectures online and there'll be local study groups, right? And so probably you've already done that in some settings. You have a study group, watch the lectures material, but we have a larger study group that's not doing this, okay? And you get credit for it. That's <laughs> not so bad, right? Okay, so that's the idea. So when you uh, divide the lecture, you can go over the material a couple of times and so you're sort of familiar with it. You can take notes or whatever. And what we'll do is, for the most part, if you can make your files into a PDF, okay, you share it with us ahead of time, hopefully not like 10 minutes before class, although that's exactly what I do, okay? But if you can be a little bit more prepared than me, then you uh, do it a, a day in advance or so, okay? And then you share the materials to the shared folder, okay, as a PDF file. We will download it to this uh, uh, iPad, and then you use the iPad annotation utility to annotate uh, while you're doing lecture, okay? And it will be captured on um, the Zoom client that we have here, okay? So you'll see like those nice videos that they have a, a thumbnail of the lecture. You, you'll be on, on the camera in, in that type of thumbnail there. And then the rest of the screen will be the iPad, okay? So you can just annotate as you wish, okay? And don't worry, it's going to YouTube, so it'll be there. So all of your mistakes and guffaws and uh, ahs and ums will be captured in the forever online. Okay, but you know, you've watched plenty of lectures, no one actually cares. They're really interested in the material. So people are very forgiving when you put material online, okay? The whole point of this class is instead of watching these materials in private, where you don't give back to the lecturer, we want to build on top, okay? So we're going to represent the lecture. We definitely give credit back to Peter's course at UCB. Okay, we acknowledge their contribution and we're building on it. And we're trying to other, do other value add, okay? So another part of the value adding is to make sure that we have uh, contributed extra information, okay? So I want to show you what that means, okay? So um, in Slack, I've already shared with you the link to this folder, right? So this folder has the material that we're gonna keep for this course, okay? One of the things that you'll do as a scribe, and I invite everyone to do this today, because you know, I don't have a scribe assigned, okay, uh, is to access the Google document for this one. Okay, so every week, the scribes that are assigned to do the scribing duty will create a Google doc, okay, and then you can contribute notes, okay, take uh, uh, note of what the lecturer is saying, you can work with them ahead of time, and you can scribe ahead of time, but most people don't bother. They just you know, okay, I'm here at class, my duty is to scribe, okay? And then you just enter the notes, okay? And then you can contribute, okay? You can put whatever you want there. Uh, minimally, if you're scribing, uh, put your name there, okay? So we know uh, you are part of the, the team that does the scribing for it, okay? So the only other problem with Google Docs is it doesn't write equations well. So if you want to write equations, I suggest you use a separate utility, you use a LaTeX uh, compiler, or you, you can use uh, even Google Colab or something like that. Write the LaTeX, uh, take a screenshot, and then paste it in. That's the best we can do right now, because uh, Google Drive doesn't really support that. OK? 
Okay, so if you're wondering where it is, uh, again, if you go back to Slack, uh, you'll see it here, okay? There, there is the link, uh, bit.ly 6101-1910-drive-folder. Then you open it up, you should be able to see the lecture notes for this week, which I just blatantly copied from UCB, and then the lecture notes that uh, uh, scribe that you can put in. Okay, everyone happy with that so far? Any questions? Okay, so what do you do as a scribe? Okay, you can take notes on what the lecturer is saying. Okay, and it's also a very good idea because again, we'll have a couple of people assigned to scribe to take different roles as the scribe. Okay, what do I mean by that? For example, there's a lot of this work that we're covering today that is actually state of the art, you know, no more than six months old. All right, so why is that important? Because it hasn't been codified into a textbook or anything. Okay. What can you do? You can go to the web, find the information, and paste it in the Google document. Right? So, for example, when people mention certain archive papers, okay, in deep learning, most of the things are on archive, right? So you go to archive, find the paper, and then you put the link into the Google Doc. All right? Then everyone will have that information. Okay? And then you can also, um, you know, if you've watched a video from Peter's lecture, you can even give it a timestamp in the original lecture. You know? Peter mentioned this paper here, etc. Okay, this Google Doc that we're going to work on as part of the scribe group every week will be then published, made public. We're going to make it into a PDF file. Okay, we're going to post it on the website. And again, anyone who comes to find deep unsupervised learning from NUS will find that we have done our job adding content on top of these CD lectures. Okay, that's the whole point. Okay, so there are these two duties. Lecturing, again, the idea is you, you come at the end of class, you divvy up the uh, responsibility, you watch as much as you can, okay? Then you lecture, if you're not sure about the math or any other part of it, no problem. It's a discussion group. It's not meant to be that focused on making sure you have technical abilities to say everything, okay? It's uh, better that you don't memorize exactly what the PhD said, but you internalize it, you try to uh, repeat what you know, okay? And then on the other side of that, uh, describing, again, you can uh, decide how you want to split up the roles. Some of you can be looking for auxiliary information or papers and putting them in. Some people can be uh, putting this information on, online right away, okay, in the Google Doc. And uh, you could also moderate the Slack channel. So we have the Slack channel here, the general channel. Many people, they'll do both, okay, they'll uh, scribe in the uh, document. But uh, in a timely fashion, you can also put links to papers in Slack, okay? But then it'll be very easy to find. Okay, any questions? Yeah, it's view only. It's view only. Okay, that's no good. Let's fix that right now. Let's get rid of this. Okay, find and view. More. Okay, which image? Public on the web. Uh, try reloading and see whether you can get to it. Okay, so if you can, do bring your laptop. Uh, unfortunately, this room doesn't have charging points either, so it's a little bit hard to get at. Okay, any questions? So again, this is a discussion group, so it should be so quiet throughout the entire lecture. So uh, <laughs> please go ahead um, and discuss. Okay, so... Um, the next thing we want to do is go through the rest of the logistics, which is to make sure that you guys know who is assigned to what. So um, there are two parts of this. One is that you had to sign up for the course through the Google form to acknowledge that you're actually participating and that you're committed to doing the course. Okay, that means you have to come every week to attend either online, okay, if you can't make it in, fine, uh, or um, you know, come physically to class as it is, all right? And then we have to assign you to a, a particular group. So uh, I see a number of you have put your names in here. I haven't assigned tasks yet, but I will do that uh, maybe during the midterm, uh, the mid lecture break. Okay, Let's make sure we have enough people assigned to this. Okay. So the important thing here is uh, again, uh, what I want to do is make sure that we have enough scribes and enough individuals for every week. So right now, uh, it looks like we have uh, one to two people for every. Uh, role in lecture, 
but we're going to try to bump this up at least so that we have two to three people. Okay. All right. So um, again, how this works is uh, when you log in, uh, if you haven't done this already, you uh, fill out a role for yourself. Okay. Then you tell me um, in the uh, columns out over here, which lectures you're interested in presenting. Okay. And you, of course, you should think about your, your workload, right? If, if like uh, you're an undergraduate and week 12 and week 13 are really bad for you because it's finals and preparation, all the projects are closing and same for graduate students, then you might want to opt for an earlier week, okay? And those external participants, you can think about your work schedule, et cetera, and then put preference, okay? So your preferences here, I'm just gonna take a, in a linear fashion. So if you put five and six, then I regard five as more important than six. But uh, even if I can't assign you any of those, hopefully it's fair game for you. Okay. So if I assign you a week, you really, really can't come. No worries. Just let me know. We can uh, try to help uh, people trade slots. And so uh, we'll be able to get things done. Okay. Everyone all right with this? Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, let's get started then. Okay, I only watched this lecture once, so I, I also need your help. Who here has actually watched the lecture? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, eight, nine, okay. So please do watch the lectures ahead of time. Otherwise, it's not going to be meaningful for discussion, right? I mean, you could sit through yet another lecture of the same person as YouTube, but of course, we are neophytes here. We're not going to be able to present as well as those students who, uh, and professors who are actually doing this type of research, right? So we want it to be meaningful in a discussion, okay? So uh, go ahead and put in those preferences. I will try to assign. Uh, you'll notice you can't edit these columns. Okay, those are for me to edit. Um, and then I, I otherwise, okay? Hey, if you're on the Zoom call, uh, I'm gonna mute you for a while. And uh, let's go to this setup here. Let's see, I'm gonna go to Zoom, and I'm gonna stop sharing, and I'm going to share something else. Okay, so we're gonna get started on the motivation. So um, I think you guys have uh, dealt with the concept of unsupervised learning. Can anyone tell me what unsupervised learning is? guys are acting like all like undergraduates who don't want to talk in class. <laughs> Sir, you ready? Cheng Heng. Cheng Heng. Go ahead. Take a whole bunch of unstructured data and you also do a model and then figure out what to do. Okay, so you give it data and you hope for the best. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, that's basically right, right? But. Um, can we give more expression about this? Anyone else? The data without target, so they're unlabeled. Your name again, sir? I am Ken. Ken. Yeah. Okay, Ken says it's uh, la data without labels, right? So we don't have target values here. So if you remember your uh, machine learning, you have an X, which is your data matrix or data instance uh, uh, vector, right? And typically in supervised learning, you're given a label Y. To, to induce, so we don't have that, so we're just given data, right? So uh, what we want to do is capture uh, rich patterns, uh, which we can get, uh, hopefully using unsupervised learning to do that, right? Uh, so we know what uh, uh, deep neural networks are, so basically stacks of neural nets together, and uh, we can do it in a label-free way, as uh, what Ken and uh, Ken Young said earlier and uh, try to create some generative models, right? So the generative models are nice because then you can create new data on the fly, you know, right? Based on maybe the probability of that data being generated from uh, the generalization of that model, and then um, go forward with that, right? And the other part of it is uh, like self-supervised learning. Um, does anyone know what this particular part means here from the lecture, do you recall? Basically, one, one, one some kind of reconstruction, reconstructing the input. 
so we can uh, manipulate it in some way and then ask the model to learn the reconstruct. That essentially requires the model to be to learn the understand semantic understanding of the context. Okay, so we want to generalize from the data to some kind of semantic model and then be able to have parameters that we can change to produce new ones, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you want to generate some semantic concept because we know from machine learning, gen, uh, understanding a concept in general, there's too many uh, possibilities, right? So you have to be able to abstract from the data given. Otherwise, you'll just memorize the data. Okay, in order to come up with a, a concept. Okay, so um, if you watch lecture, they, they made this comment about what Jeff Hinton said in his lecture, right? So he basically said that basically, if you look at the amount of data that people are exposed to, right, and you say, okay, when do you get actual supervision? Actually, there's not a lot of times you get actual supervision about things, right? I mean, in school we do, we take tests, we get things right or wrong. Right? But most of what we go through in life, we don't get any feedback for. So how do you learn the structure from that, right? So basically he said, there's, there's no way that in our lifetime, we would accumulate enough supervision to be able to perform the tasks that we are actually able to perform, right? So in that sense, there must be other times, okay? Uh, most of the time we are learning from data in an unsupervised manner, right? So if you think, we have to get something like 10, uh, 10 to the fifth uh, dimensions of constraints per, per second, meaning those weights that are being set in our own neural networks are being set at a phenomenal rate because we're being exposed, our, our brain chemistry is changing in order to meet this. Right? Okay. So I think that's a pretty interesting part. Any questions on that, comments? Nope, you guys are really quiet. Okay, so um, the other part of this was that, you know, because of this idea of uh, the different paradigms of machine learning, right, we have uh, reinforcement learning, we have unsupervised learning, and we have supervised learning. Uh, if we are thinking about uh, trying to create something like a general uh, artificial intelligence, right, a, a GAI, right, which people are interested in doing, uh, hopefully not Skynet or something as dangerous as that, okay. Well, what, what methods do we have, right? We have something like uh, pure reinforcement learning, okay? So that means uh, actually we can't do that very much because there's not a lot of cases in which we can give actual supervision back, right? The, predict, uh, the machine predicts a scalar and then they're told once in the blue moon that they get some reward, right? So that's the case of, you know, when you have Atari games or StarCraft or something like that, uh, sometimes there's an update about how well you do a score uh, or you win the game or something like that and then you have to back propagate all that information back to your network and decide what you're going to change for all the other timestamps right that you don't get any feedback for. okay then there's the supervised learning right uh, let's go away okay so supervised learning is basically what we're already doing right so you can predict uh, human labeled uh, supply data but because this is very hard to get, it's also very expensive to obtain. That also can't be where the bulk of learning occurs, right? So just like what we are talking about uh, uh, just on the last slide is we have to really think about doing unsupervised learning, right? The unsupervised learning, we get data all the time. So if we can find some way to use that to either cluster or do density estimation or outlier detection, any of these typically unsupervised tasks or generate uh, models, then we can do that. Okay. So the other part that we can think about, uh, as they said, was to think about um, compression as a specific task of, of all what we've talked about, right? When you think about unsupervised learning, that should be one of the applications that you should think of. So what does compression require? If you can take a look at from the slide. Don't worry so much about the technical terminology. I also don't know it. Why did they say that this is a task that uh, represents unsupervised learning well? Martin? Sorry? 
Exactly. We need to know the structure, right? When we are thinking about unsupervised learning, we want to cluster the data. We want to have some semantic understanding of it so that we can do generation later. It requires us to have some model of how that data uh, has some regularity, right? And if we know the regularities, then we have a capability of compressing the data better, right? Because we're going to take those regularities and try to code them in such a way that it's more compressed. We need less, less bits in order to transmit useful information about um, that uh, particular regularity, right? So in fact, I think part of the lectures we cover again Huffman coding, which is a, a topic that undergraduates sometimes cover in uh, algorithms, okay? So we'll see that later on, okay? So there is a lot of uh, application areas, like we've seen deep fakes uh, appear on the news a lot. So those are, uh, applications of this, right? The whole point is that you, if you learn a semantic representation of a model, right, the underlying data, you can compress it, but you can also generate new samples, right? Basically, once you have a model, the model is basically some uh, representation of the underlying data that the model has seen, right? Then you just sample from that space, right? You've got this big probability distribution over all possible inputs x, right? Script x if you want, or all possible data. Okay, and you just pick out samples of that and you ask, what does the sample look like, right? So you can sample an image from this distribution, sample text from this distribution, then you will generate a new image or a new text on the fly. Okay? So uh, the other thing that's very nice about uh, doing the learning as opposed to just unsupervised learning is that many of these systems we know are what? How do we build a, a building block when we're talking about deep learning? What's the phrase that you keep on hearing? Uh, layers. layers, that's one of it. Yeah, so we're going to stack layers on top of layers, but then we can compose systems. Transfer learning, that's part of the solution, right? So transfer learning means we, we have already trained the system and we want to work on another uh, domain or another area. So we're going to use a system that was previously trained for a task that wasn't, but we might adapt it in some way, right? So that's one solution. The other word that I'm looking for is end-to-end. -end. Have you heard this before? Yeah? End-to-end, -end. so I'll write it up there. Okay, so a lot of these models, they, they start from the data and they go all the way to the finished product and all of this is a big neural network input. Okay, so what's nice about this is you can take this neural model and just like we talked about transfer learning and uh, layering, right? You can just take off some of those layers, put something else on or put it next to another model that's doing something else, right? So you have this nice composability that allow you to do all sorts of funny things, you know, and people are trying lots of Frankenstein experiments to, to get these things to work, right? So when we do transfer learning, if we've taken uh, computer vision before, what they do is typically they train a neural network, right? Um, and then they say, okay, starting from the very primitive layers where we are learning like pixel values and things like this, we might learn some corners, some edges, edge detectors, textures, etc. And as we go harder up in the layers, we get more abstraction. So we finally might be able to have a detector for faces, a detector for car, a detector for sheep, et cetera. And then if I tear those uh, layers off, I can replace it with brand new layers that are going to learn a new concept, right? Yeah, question? So what you're saying is when you say end to end, you basically talk about using pixels, different eyes, so different faces are solved out there. Um, what I mean is, uh, and you guys can help clarify too, so some of you are doing this research, right? So what I mean end-to-end -end is that you have an entire neural network that goes from the data to the finished product, the, basically the decision, okay, or the generation of new data, the sampling of the data, right? And then you can compose these models, you know, you can have one model go from, uh, let's say, from data over here, okay, and then reach, let's say, a photo, make a photo, and then you can have this system, you know, create a caption, right? And then this photo can create a video, 
and something like that. So you can do all of these. You can just compose these end-to-end -end applications, create new systems on the fly. Okay. So what is, is there an example of So traditional machine learning methods, okay, let's say if you think about um, things like I guess support vector machines or decision trees, uh, decision forests, they don't have this quality because you can't back propagate all the way through. Okay. What I mean by that is you get stuck somewhere around here. Okay. So let's say you have a decision tree here and a decision tree here. Okay. Uh, you've trained this system okay, separately, okay, and it's working well. Okay, but let's say you want to plug it on photos it's not seen or trained on. Perhaps now I want to detect, uh, you know, take photos of galaxies because I'm an astronomer rather than ImageNet, which is, uh, you know, natural images and stuff. Then I'm stuck. I have no way of uh, retuning this system down here. Okay, but with a neural network, that's not a problem, right? Because we all know about gradient descent. Hopefully, if you don't know, don't worry about it. We'll cover it a bit later. Okay. So the gradient ascent, descent mechanisms that neural nets are trained on allow us to propagate, sorry, uh, back all the way through the network, even to things that are already trained. Right. So if you do any bit of NLP or things of that sort, you will have come across the word embeddings. Right. Embeddings are like that. Okay. So embeddings in, in word embeddings, basically you have a vector that's been already pre-trained and pre-tuned to represent the semantics of words. And just like this gentleman, you're so, sorry, your name again? Uh, Sinjie. Sinjie. So Sinjie said, uh, you know, when we do transfer learning, we're trying to adapt from one place to another. We do the same with word embeddings, right? So word embeddings, you know, you can say, I have a general idea of what the word means, but we know in different contexts, words means different things, right? So for example, the word ring, okay, in, in standard English probably means like a circle, right? But if you think about it in the mathematical context, a ring is a specific type of mathematical uh, formalism, right? It uh, has some certain algebraic properties, right? So we wouldn't confuse the two, right? So there are different contexts in which words have different meanings. And uh, when you try to work in a new domain, let's say you're working with mathematical papers, you probably wouldn't want to use word embeddings for the general uh, area. Right, general domain because it simply wouldn't work very well. Okay, so there's plenty of things like that. Right. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So you can generate images. So these were, I think, they said uh, uh, images that were generated off of uh, MNIST. So you probably heard of this data set. So this is uh, this part stands for the National Institute for Standards and Technology. It's an a, a institute in the U.S. that does a lot of the standards. For example, they determine how many how many kilograms is a kilogram, right? Those types of things. Okay, but they created this data set, which is basically um, used widely in machine learning. I think most of you have heard of it before, right? Yes. Okay. So it's just a bit a bunch of handwritten digits that people have written uh, for addresses on envelopes. And uh, at that time, the US Postal Service was looking into, uh, could they automate uh, you know, the computerization of handwritten um, addresses? Okay, so they studied this problem. They asked contractors to work on it. And uh, quite a lot of the machine learning community and the vision community started with these problems, right? So prior to uh, around early 2000s, most people are using very traditional methods for doing this. So I think the, the lead for uh, doing this was uh, support vector machines. All, all the time in the 90s, people were using support vector machines. But right around the turn of 2000, 2002 to 2006, uh, there was a blossoming of people who were starting to be able to use neural nets to do this work. Okay? So this is one of the original papers that looked at this. Um, for example, this gentleman here, Okay, he was actually a postdoc at NUS around 2006 or so. Okay, now he's in uh, University College London, I think, or something like that. Um, but he, uh, they were using generative models to create the images after learning the model. Okay, so who knows the difference between a generative model and a discriminative model? 
Yeah, uh, go ahead, sir, in the back. Can you tell us what the difference is? Maybe this is helpful to tell. I'll depend on which one's which one. Okay. Basically, one is learning P, Y over X, one is learning P, X over one. Sorry, P, X, comma, one. Okay, yeah. So one is learning, like, you know, to have known the distribution. Well, basically, something like this. Okay. So what are the two? Can anyone identify which one is the generative model? This is the generative one, right? Okay. And this is the discriminative one, right? Uh, it's the opposite. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So given given x, figure out y, right? This is the standard classification task, right? You're given an instance. You need to figure out what its label is. That's supervised learning, right? That's the discriminative model, right? And the generative one says. No, I don't care. Just tell me what the data is supposed to look like, right? And then uh, the good thing about this is when you have a model of what the data looks like, you can run it to get a label because you're generating the X and the Y values together, right? So you can do the discriminative task too, but you're using some power in the model to also generalize the data itself. You need to know the likelihood of the data so you can use it to generate images. Okay, so um, they've done this uh, for a couple different things. I don't remember too much. Right? You can use this for generating images. You've heard of generative adversarial networks, and we're going to cover them in class. Some of you will be responsible for doing that. Okay, and generate uh, even better images. So these are all fake houses, right? Not actually real, but they look pretty good to me. I wish I lived in such a nice place. Singapore, our, our apartments are so tiny, right? Yeah. Looks like you didn't even have swimming pools or something. I don't know. Okay. Uh, you can generate face images. So these are all, again, not real faces. This is already pretty cool. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, basically, you can look at the, the types of resolution that people are able to generate with, uh, again, networks now. Have you seen this example before? I think most of you have, right? Where they take an image of a horse. Well, not even an image. This is a video of a horse. Right, and uh, they ask the system to, um, you know, generate zebra stripes for it. They do it in a convincing manner that's uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, each of the images in turn looks looks quite uh, realistic. So uh, yeah, they, they've gotten even better and better. So these these pictures, I think, you wouldn't be able to tell that they're not actual people. Right, so they're they're just samples from a distribution. Right. So what did they do? They took lots of images of faces. They ran a model through it to get a, uh, a probability distribution of the data. And then there are competing samples over that data, right? They're saying, okay, I'm gonna draw a sample of, of the data out of here. And that data point, when appropriately inversed, uh, can generate an image. Right? So all of these are images pulled out from the data distribution that don't exist in the ground. Okay, so you can generate audio, obviously, and uh, people are already generating video, right? So you see deep fakes where people, um, uh, those are not so imaginative, but yeah, they're just uh, faking a little bit of the lips and, and the head, right? Okay. Uh, I'm in natural language processing, so I'm also in, interested in being able to generate text. It's getting quite good. So uh, you can see that uh, if it's trained over Shakespeare's or plays, you can generate somewhat realistic, uh, realistic uh, looking text. And uh, we've had cases already in the community where they're, they're doing this type of Turing test, right? Everyone knows what the Turing test is? Yeah? So they, they've had cases where uh, they've had a system write poems, right? And then they have people write poems. They publish the entire anthology. And you don't know which one is which. Okay, so uh, only they know as the publisher. They can even write scientific papers, right? So this is LaTeX on the left here, right? This is what you might be writing uh, for your uh, assignments, right? And it's gonna generate this. Uh, uh, of course, MIT pranksters like to do all these types of things. So they take these papers, they submit them to conferences and then tell you, show everyone that the reviewers don't know what they're doing. Right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, again, we want to relate this back to the idea of compression, 
right? So I said one of the key things like Martin was telling us earlier that compression is one of the key aspects in which you need to have a semantic understanding of the data in order to compress it well, okay? So here we are taking the CIFAR 10 data set. So anyone know CIFAR? CIFAR is a precursor of, yeah, precursor of ImageNet. Basically, they took stock photos of uh, certain types of images. 10 here means, I think there's only 10 classes, okay? 10 types of objects. They took lots of samples of this, I think around 2005 or something like there, okay? And they uh, basically set up what we call the shared task. They asked people in the community worldwide who are working on vision, build the best classifier you can for these 10 image classes, okay? Well, you know, if you need to be able to compress images, uh, then we can look at how many bits per dimension are need to be stored, okay? So by that, we can say for each dimension should be each RGB channel, each pixel would have three dimensions, okay? And then we want to look at the amount of uh, data that I have to retain in order to represent that picture in a lossless manner. Right? So if I say, I'm going to be able to reproduce that image again, right? Uh, I, uh, exactly with the same pixel values, then I'm going to store representation of it uh, that's smaller, right? So ping, uh, uh, probably many of you are familiar with, it's a, a compression technology that is lossy. You can, it's found all over the web, right? But then, uh, of course, lower numbers mean better here, and you can see that uh, our deep neural networks are able to now uh, quite uh, well represent these generative aspects of the, the underlying data to present uh, things that are almost half the size of a web standards that are still in use today, right? So imagine your four terabyte drive gets eight terabytes in size, right? Just, just because people have upgraded the software a little bit, right? That's, that's what's going on, okay? So you can see for the same amount of storage space, how different uh, the output comes out. So if you look on the, the projector here, it's not very clear, but if you look at the slide itself in the slide deck, it's quite clear. The JPEG one is actually quite yucky looking. So this is intentionally sampled with very low resolution. So the JPEG doesn't work well, but for the same amount of this space, you can get an image that looks like the one over here, right? So that one looks a lot sharper, right? So, you know, some of these things are really interesting because when you try to generate a model of the underlying data, you may get some other semantic features for free, okay? So a very popular task that people like to do in, in natural language processing is sentiment detection, right? Does everyone know what sentiment detection means? Should I explain it briefly? Okay, so I will. Uh, basically, you take a sentence and you try to decide whether the person uh, or the, the task, uh, the sentence there represents something positive, negative, or neutral, all right? So this is very important, for example, for automating understanding of student feedback, right? You all have to write student feedback for lectures. Hey, this lecturer is nasty, never replies to my email, always late, the lecture notes are never on time. That's exactly the type of feedback I get, okay? <laughs> so, um, you know, we want to automate this process so we, we don't have to have people read it just, you know, uh, put a dashboard up and you have an arrow, how bad are you as a lecturer? All, or, yeah, you have to go to remedial training, et cetera. Okay, so things like that we'd like to automate, okay? So the nice thing about uh, unsupervised learning is that when you build a semantic representation of the text, sometimes you get these dimensions in your data set for free, right? So we would be able to, for example, in uh, sentiment detection, to be able to find dimensions within the data that represent sentiment, right? Isn't that cool? Just, just by looking at lots of data with, without a particular care to uh, sentiment, but just trying to compress it, understand it semantically, we get out the notion, hey, you know, some of the texts are positively sentiment, some of them are quite negative, and most of them are neutral, right? So uh, just by doing this type of dimensionality understanding, but I'm not gonna talk about a lot of these. I think you, you get the idea that um, um, these supervised learning is a, is a 
in important technology that's maturing, it still has a long way to go. As you can see uh, from this slide here, um, there's still a sizable gap to doing uh, really fully supervised searching where a human is labeling things, right? But the whole point is that, you know, because we are exposed to data all the time, our systems are uh, gathering data all the time, maybe there's some structure that we can learn for free, right? We don't always have to start with expensive uh, supervision as, as the point here, right? Okay. So any questions so far? Okay. Question. Yeah, go ahead. So um, what you're saying is that if you do a very, if you come up with a very good compression scheme, it can learn good semantic optimization, right? For some things, yes. Yeah. So yeah. definitely for language and uh, vision, that's very much the case. That when you get a good representation of the data, you, you can learn some corollary features of it, right? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't, how are we sure that that will happen? Because we know that if you want a good compression scheme, well, if you have a good schematic representation, you have a good compression scheme. But why is it true the other way around? What do you mean? So how are we sure that if we can compress something well, then our compression scheme gives us a good schematic representation? Okay. Can anyone else answer that? Oh, yeah. So um, I'm sure that so in information theory, right? The idea is that um, if you, the optimum holding for that say a particular message, right, requires you to match how one way we are uh, basically reducing the size, let's say a string, right? Imagine you have a message string, right? Is to do this thing called a uh, variable length compression, where basically symbols that appear more often can represent, let's say, lesser bits. Lesser, lesser symbols. Right? So a good example is Morse code. So E would be like one dot, for example, Morse code. So what happens is that in information theory, they say that if you want to, let's say, reduce the, you want to have a string and you want to reduce it to the minimum length of that string, what happens is that your, the, <clears throat> the symbols should, the length of the symbols should be inversely proportional to the probability that they occur. So let's say something more frequent, you basically could Proportionally reduce the length of it. So the thing is that if, say, you have a proper compression scheme, right, if it was truly optimal, right, you would therefore be able to work backwards using the idea of information theory, the, the ideal probability distribution. And likewise, if you know the probability distribution, you would therefore also know how best to compress the string, right? So this is how knowing better compression leads to a better representation. In this case, a better representation. Okay, that's part of it, definitely, right? So uh, I think Eugene was asking also about the word semantic, right? So definitely when we're doing compression, we want to make sure that frequent things that we encounter, frequent events that we encounter, we encode with less bits, and rare events we encode with more bits, right? This is how we get away from the average uh, number of bits that we need to represent each particular data item, right? So this is exactly what uh, Liang Ming was saying, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Ming Liang was saying about uh, variable uh, length coding, right? The other part that Eugene was talking about is semantics, right? What do we mean by semantics and how do we guarantee that semantics is built in or baked in to, to, uh, to what we get generatively? Anyone want to take a stab at that? There's no guarantee. Avana, do you want to elaborate or never mind? I, I think there's, uh, when we talk specifically about self-supervised learning, so there's also this component where we have to recreate what we compressed. So that that encourages the model to learn the semantic relationship between the data. So that's one of the ways when we can ensure that okay, the compressed version is learning. Because it has to recreate, say we are trying to recreate the image, then it, it has to learn that, okay, with the table, a chair might come. These, these are the different kinds of semantic concepts that the model will be encouraged to learn in that compressed form. So okay. Exactly. So I would say, uh, you know, the gentlemen over here are correct. That there's no guarantee, right? But because of the data being structured as it is, right? Because we usually see tables of chairs, 
know, we usually see them on the same level, you know, left angling in the air flying around, okay, that those regularities present themselves often enough that they can be compressed, okay? So there's a side effect of the structure of the data having semantic consistency that allows it, us to compress it well, okay? But there's no guarantees, okay? So for example, if we go back to this task where we're doing sentiment analysis, right? We get that for free uh, because there are lots of texts that just happen to have a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment. And to recreate that text well, it helps to remember that, you know, oh, this person was positive, oh, that person was negative. You think about it yourself. How do you remember whether, uh, what this paragraph says? If I were to close the laptop and turn it off, right? You would probably not be able to reproduce the actual word. Right? But we can give a close proxy to it, right? And our close proxy might include information about, you know, whether somebody was positive or negative, you know, or about certain concepts. So even though we might not use the same words, we have the semantic representation of that context, but we might use a synonym to express it. We might use an alternative grammar to represent it, right? But that semantic structure, we've got this thought in our head. That is some type of compressed semantic representation of what we're doing. And we're then using our linguistic faculty, our generative faculty, to recreate the sentence, recreate the paragraph, right? So I, I think that answers your question in part, okay? Great discussion so far. Other things that you guys want to bring up? So when you say semantic similarity for something like a visual image, mm -hmm. do you mean that there is some sort of a latent representation of the norm? Because semantic is a word for which you would associate more with NLP, but in all other places, when you mean semantic, it's like there's an underlying representation. Common is that we? Yeah. So what we mean by common is it's um, frequent in the data, right? So if you give it images of natural surroundings, like I said before, your semantics might be, you know, uh, things that we can expect in the physical world. Like I said, we don't expect these office chairs to be flying around in the air. We don't expect people to be upside down. Right? In most images, we won't find that. If we see that, we call that abstract art, okay? But, you know, normally uh, Im images don't have that quality. So when we're trying to understand that data and represent it in the model, then if we're trying to compress that or we're trying to generate that, we will have a semantic representation that just happens to favor that as a representation, right? So you, when you sample from the model, probably you're going to end up with images that don't have chairs flying up in the air because most of the data it's seen has not seen anything of that sort. Yeah. So it, it holds to all aspects, you know, not just to natural images. Like if you were to pollute, ask a uh, deep learning system to hallucinate images of galaxies, you know, they'd probably look like the galaxies that are in the data set, right? They would like, look like random noise, for example. Does that answer your question in part? Okay. Any other things? Okay, uh, let's stop here for uh, a while. We actually haven't gotten to the, the heart of the second part of the lecture. We'll try to cover a little bit of that uh, in a while. So let's take a five minute break. And then after that, we'll, we'll, we'll start for the second half, all right? Okay, we're gonna get started again. All right, um, okay, I only watched this part of the lecture once, so I'm really, really rusty on this, okay? So uh, I shouldn't even say rusty because I never got good at it, okay? But uh, we'll, we'll try our best and I'm gonna need your help. Uh, again, for those who watched the video, please weigh in and, and correct me, okay? So um, for this part, we're gonna start covering uh, some of the lecture material on autoregressive models, and that's gonna form the basis for a lot of uh, technology that we want to go through, okay? So uh, we've already done the motivation, right? And so uh, Peter nicely handed off to his graduate students for the rest of the lecture. Uh, I don't have that luxury, but I can hand it over to all of you for subsequent lectures, so that's good, okay? But the point here is that we're gonna start with a simple, simple generative model and then show you how that doesn't work and then think about uh, maybe if it doesn't work, maybe we can find a solution through neural networks. Does neural network solve everything, right? No, okay. Anyways, the whole point is like, we want to start with uh, trying to model, um, okay, 
Um, can, can we try to uh, find ways of representing the data, right? So what we want to do is say uh, for all the data, okay, any data that's possible, script X for all the possible things that we could see, what is the probability of seeing that point, right? So we're given samples of data, capital X, not script, okay? So I'm gonna differentiate, okay? We have um, something like script X, meaning all the possible types of data that we can see. So for example, if you were to look at an image, a 128 by 128 image, what's the space of values that it contains, right? So we can figure that out, it's pretty simple. Each pixel out of the 128 by 128, so there are a square of that, right? Each of those pixels has three values, uh, RGB, okay? And then all the RGB values that it could take, right? So if you multiply all those things together, you get a tremendously large number, right? But if you take a look at any, fixing any of those, all of those dimensions, then you have a single data point in this very large space. Right, this very large grid uh, that we call script X, right? And then the data that we're given, let's say we're uh, giving CIFAR data. So we have lots of pictures of cars and airplanes. That's our capital X, right? This is the observed data that we see, right? Like for example, right now I'm looking at you, you're looking at me or your laptop, you're seeing a picture okay? you're not seeing random noise. Although most images that you would get in this script X space would be random noise. So obviously what we want to do with this is to come up with a likelihood for a specific data point drawn from here, okay? How likely is that to be something that could have originated from here, right? So whatever we sample from here will be some <coughs> small x, right? A, a particular data sample. And we're just asking, okay, for this image, how likely was it? Or for this piece of text, how likely was it generated from the samples of data that you saw? So that's all we're doing. We're computing this P of X for some arbitrary X that we are given, right? And how we can do that in some cases is like say, we want to generate data instead. I want to generate a new image. I can sample, right? I, I first compute this probability distribution, okay? I'm not gonna explicitly enumerate it because it would be fast, right? Very big. For each possible thing in X, I would have to give it a sign of probability. Right? So to list that out on a table would be tremendous, right? too big. Right? Instead, what I want to do is compute some model. Right? And this model, this P of X, is what we're going after in this class. Right? We want to generate a model that can assign probabilities. And after we have that probabilistic model, then I can just sample from it. Right? So I can say, oh, you know, I have this probability distribution. Pick something from that distribution. Okay. In other words, I sample a point, maybe hopefully it'll be a sample that's fairly likely, okay? So it's not gonna be random noise. And then I sample it from there, and then I can uh, use that to create the X, right? To create the image, to create the test, okay? So today we're gonna be working with discrete data. So you can think of images as discrete because that's what they are, right? The pixel values, they are in three colors and then they have an actual value. You can use this. Okay, like I said, if you have this type of image, a small image, 128 by 120, a thumbnail size, right? It's like an avatar or something like that. Okay, you, you're actually having a very high dimensional space already. Right? You have 50,000 individual values that have to take a scalar value. So this, uh, if you look at the size of that data set, it's very large, right? So we need to be able to compute some of these properties in an efficient manner, right? So it has to be computationally and statistically efficient to do the type of operations that we want to do, okay? So that means all of these things here, right? Be able to efficiently represent the data, uh, calculate the likelihood of that particular data point, okay? And to be able to sample it efficiently so that we can get uh, data samples quite quickly. And of course, to, to do the same things with the compression, right? To represent it in a small model so that we don't have lug around a big uh, SSG just to carry around. Okay, 
So let's start with a really toy model that they talked about in the lecture, right? So one of them, one thing that you could do is to say, if you wanted to uh, think about the likelihood of the data, well, that's easy. You can just count, right? So if you imagine I have a six-sided die, right? And I want to represent that die as a model. Well, what do I do? I roll it, right? I roll it enough times, and then I take a look at the samples, and I, I, I have a sample of whether that die is fair or not, right? Maybe I used it too many times. Maybe my sum put blue on one side or something. So it's not a fair die anymore. But by rolling it enough times, I have a probability distribution for that, right? And I can count the, the number of times a certain sample appeared, like the number of times six appeared or one appeared. And then I can use that as a probabilistic model of the data, right? I can ask it, how likely is it I'm going to roll a five? or roll two sixes in a row, right? All of that is something I can do with a generative model, right? Why doesn't that work in our case when we're talking about this type of data that we're going at? It's very high dimension. Can you elaborate on that? Okay, did everyone hear that? So the problem is, even if you're trying to build a histogram of that, like I was doing in the die case, you wouldn't be able to do that very well. Why? Because each image is a unique data point, right? Even if I permute by standing a little bit to the side, I get a completely different image. And the dimensions of that image are, as Eugene said, 128 by 128 times three times 256 values for each one, right? So if I look at a data set of images, how many times is each image going to appear in the data set? Once, right? You wouldn't have the same two cat pictures unless you had probably you know, duplicate detection or something like that, right? So what does your distribution look like, your histogram look like? Right, our die histogram looked a little bit like this, right? I'm gonna say one, two, three, four, five, six. So maybe I, hopefully I have a you know uniform distribution, so it looks like this, right? So this this area here starts with one, right? If I have an unfair distribution, maybe it looks a little bit different than that. Maybe it looks. Okay, but it's still a distribution. What does our distribution look like when we're talking about images? Well, it would look like this, right? Right, because we have so few samples compared to the possible X values, right? So when we think about sampling that distribution, how helpful is it? It's not helpful at all, why? Because when you sample, the only points that are non-zero are images already in your data set, right? You wouldn't be able to generate new images, right? You would only generate samples that are already things that you've seen before, right? Of course, when we roll a die, a six-sided die, that's exactly what we expect, right? We roll it and we expect to get a number one through six. We don't expect to get like 4.5, right? That would be crazy. But exactly, that's what we want to do when we're doing deep generative networks. Right? We wanted to generate a new sample that's not seen before, but the generative power of something like a histogram is not going to do that. It's not compressing anything. It's just memorizing the data set, right? The only times when we have statistical power is when events repeat themselves. We're not going to have that case when we're thinking of large data sets, right? So there's a problem here. This type of thing won't work, right? So that's what it's saying here. The simple model of doing something like a likelihood model is very simple. You just take a histogram, right? Count the times of, uh, the number of times that an event occurs, sample from the underlying distribution, and you have a sample. But it has to be a sample that you've seen before, right? Okay, so we want a meaningful way of sampling things that have not been seen before. We can't rely on something like a histogram. So we have to generalize over this huge X space, right? We have to find some way to compress that, okay? So at runtime, 
switching gears a little bit, what do we want to do, all right? What can we do with a, 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 a likelihood model, right? Uh, we would want to be able to do some inference, right? So querying the probability of a data point given a data point, right? So for example, you know, I take a picture of a cat, I ask a model, okay, is this a picture of a cat or not? Right? I want to know whether it looks like other things that are cats. If I have a data set of cats, without telling anything else about it, right? Okay, let me make it clear. This is not supervised, right? So when I mean that, I mean I have a collection of cat images, okay? But I don't label anything about it. I just say there's this collection of images, okay? Can you tell me whether this image is likely to have come from that data set? Or similarly, let's say I have lots of books, okay? And I have books by different authors. I can ask a, a model to try to learn unsupervisedly what types of words, grammar, patterns does a person use? For example, you use Gmail or something like that. Certainly Google has a model for you. It uses it all the time when you write emails right now, right? It predicts the text that you're supposed to type next, right? So it has learned a model about what you write, okay? That's unsupervised, right, in some way, okay? So we're generating a model and we're just asking, okay, for this data point, is it likely to have come from that model, right, for, for this, from this data set or not, okay? And the other part of this is sampling, right? So sampling is the other uh, technique that we wanna do, right, is to look up uh, in the inverse cumulative distribution uh, what, is that, all right? So we, we want to say, okay, from all the model probabilities, P1 to PK, we compute the cumulative probability distribution. So we want to create this CDF, right? So I'm gonna draw the CDF, something like that, okay? Uh, so it goes from zero to one, and this is all the possible X values that you can go, okay? So some of these are not going to be very likely. Uh, maybe, for example, some of the ones in here, uh, all these samples here are not very likely because their their cumulative probability is very low, right? The ones maybe between here and here are more likely, so that's why it increases a lot. And over here, these ones are also not very likely, right? Because again, there's only a little bit of gap here, okay? And what we want to do is uh, from this cumulative distribution, sample a data point. So what are we doing here, okay? Basically, we are trying to find a data point using this technique. How do we do that? We, since this is a cumulative distribution, it goes between zero and one, right? So all we have to do is pick a random number uniformly distributed between zero and one, okay? Let's say I pick uh, 50, okay? 0.5, okay? 0.5 is right here, okay? It corresponds to this point, okay? So the data that I'm going to generate, this X value that I want to get back will be this particular sample <coughs> here, okay? If I pick another number, let's say uh, 0.75, I roll, roll a random number generator and I get a number between one and zero, I get 0.75, I'm gonna do this again, and I'm gonna pick this data point here, okay? So this is really nice because when I get the cumulative distribution, I can just really easily sample data from my distribution, right? By picking a number and looking it up within the CDF, dropping down to the data point which it's representing and then sample from there and say, that is the data point. That's the image. This is the image that uh, is being realized. Okay. Any questions so far? You guys look very dazed. <laughs> so I, I want to make sure that we're, we're getting some of this through. Okay, do you guys know what this X is, is for? Can you guys describe it for me? That's the domain of the uh, image there. Yeah. So we essentially mapping that to the response. Your name again? Parda. Parda. 
So Pardo says, you know, this X here, if we're talking about images, you know, this one down at the bottom, where I drew the red bracket, it's basically saying the space of all possible images, right? So most of these images that are these data points at each location will be random white noise, right? Because yeah, I mean, if you roll a random die to get a 265 value, and you do it 50,000 times to compete one image, it will mostly look like random noise. Okay? But once in a while, they'll look like pictures that we, we see right now, right? Because there's some regularity, you know, between the pixels, okay? So basically, we're sampling from all of these possible images that could be constructed, right? And so for many of these images, we won't have any data, right? Like random noise that you, you might be able to generate are not likely samples in natural images, so the probability will be very low. Does that help a little bit? Anyone really lost? Um, yes. Um, how is the X uh, relate to the what you give to say the one two eight times one two eight times one two eight the whole domain X in pixels? So this X is a small X in the whole domain. So you can represent it with a probability and pick up how can I back to that image of that pixel? You represent one pixel? This, right now, what we're representing with this is the space of all possible images that are size 1 to 8 by 1 to 8 by 3. Okay, so you can just imagine, I, I make this very long vector, which it says uh, in the previous slide, right, is about a 50,000 dimensional space. Okay, so what we're doing is just saying, uh, if I take all possible values of those 50,000 dimensions, okay, and I compute one data point from it here, and then I change the values a little bit, compute another data point here, I'm gonna go through all possible script X images, okay, all possible images, okay, of that size, okay, and I'm gonna just put them on this distribution, right? Each of those data points, each picture, that I get that's one to eight by one to eight by three is a valid sample from this data set, right? So like, let's say I crop a, a small image right now, that image that I'm looking at is a valid sample from this domain, right? And all I'm saying is for each of those samples, I'm gonna associate a probability for it. Well, it's gotta be very small, right? Okay. But if I aggregate the probability over all possible images, they must, because it's a probability distribution, sum to one. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Okay, so it's really hard for you maybe to, to get the idea that this uh, x-axis represents the space of all possible images, okay? But that's what it's representing, okay? And then for each individual image, I'm associating with it a probability. Okay, hopefully natural images like the ones we're looking at right now are more likely than random noise, okay? So when I look at all of these possible images, okay, they total up their probability, they should sum to one. That's all I'm saying, okay? So when I'm sampling, right, basically I'm asking myself, find an image for me. Okay, find an image or find a text or find anything, generate a new sample for me. Okay, under the histogram model that we were just talking about, this sampling process would return one of the data points in the actual data set because it has no generative power. It's just going to reproduce what's in the data set, right? If I give it 5,000 natural images and all 5,000 of them are not repeats, okay? That means all of these 5,000 data points will be one over 5,000 likely of being the sample, right? So if you can think about it that way, let me try to erase all this stuff. Okay, Let, let's say I take a smaller data set. Let's say I take a data set of only size 10. I have 10 images, okay? Then what, what does this thing look like? It's going to be a step function, right? Somewhere 
in this size of x, right? Again, I have 128 by 128 times 3. So it's a very big space. Somewhere, one of these points is an actual thing in my data set, the actual image, okay? So it's going to be up to here, okay? One head, okay? Then somewhere else, let's say this one here is also a point. So then it will be a step function like that, okay? Point two, All right? And so what you're going to do is, uh, you know, it's going to look like this. Until I get all 10 images, right? Da, 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 to 1.0. And then there'll be basically 10 points in which the step function changes dramatically from, you know, 1 tenth to uh, uh, 2 tenths. Okay? So this is still a cumulative distribution function, right? It's a CDF, right? So I can sample from it, right? All I have to do is, like, say, roll a number. Uh, a random number generator, give me a number between one and zero, okay, 0.85, okay, 0.85, that's around here, da, 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 it runs into this wall, okay, then I sample this data point, oh, it's the eighth image in my data set, that's what it means, question, go ahead, sir. Right, to say that it's supposed to have the unit in each point as well. Sorry? Would it, does that mean the likelihood of it? It depends on where um, the sample here runs into uh, the, the cumulative distribution. It's not dependent on the gradient, okay? But uh, the gradient is associated with the likelihood uh, of images nearby. Is tied to the gradient, so it's similar at that point. Yes. Yeah. Question? Yeah, Eugene? Yeah. Um, I think if your distribution is not good, then the likelihood is actually a bit weaker because CDF is the integral of the P of X. So if you think the reciprocal of that, then P of X. Yeah, exactly. That you can so when we get to continuous cases, that will actually be the case, right? So today's lecture, we're covering discrete value. So it's basically, uh, when you look at the distribution, the cumulative distribution has to be some type of step function, right? So when it runs into the, the, the cumulative distribution, you have an infinite gradient. Right? Everyone following that? Okay. Okay, so that's exactly what we did. We said, we're going to have some model probabilities for all of the data points. Okay, uh, obviously we don't want to try to score all of these probabilities we're, uh, because they would be massive, okay? But we're just going to say that we have them. Then we're going to draw a random number, okay, between one and zero, which is what I represented over here, right? And then return the smallest data point such that it's there. So I, I've generated this particular X value, this particular image, given that I sampled point eight. So like we already said, uh, you know, even that is a, a generative model, it actually doesn't work well, okay? And they said in the course video that basically, we are not here to study just math. We are only wanting to study things that work in practice. So a lot of the things that we're going to learn throughout this course may not be not necessarily mathematically well justified. It's because empirically they work well, okay? So the understanding between what works in machine learning at least deep learning in particular, and uh, the mathematics is still quite not quite there yet. We don't know why some of the techniques that we are actually using work well, okay? And that's part of the puzzle that uh, I think we all want to work together to try to understand a little bit, okay? So like we said here, okay, even something as small as MNIST, which we just saw, those were those handwritten digits, right? They're only 28 by 28, okay? There's either not even a gray value there, either the pixel is either on or off, okay? There are going to be this number of uh, probabilities to estimate. Why? Because you take 28 times 28, that's your 784, right? And each of those pixels can have a binary value, either one or zero. So this is the size of the data set, right? That's all of your possible X, 
right? Huge, right? Uh, and that's equivalent to this, right? Uh, 10 to the uh, 236 more. I don't know. They keep on saying something ridiculous, now, like the more than the atoms, number of atoms in the universe or something like that, okay? This is not something you can store, okay? Forget it, okay? So as you can see here, just like we were talking about before, there's no way any sample of your training data is ever going to come close to hitting all these values in your domain, all this script X. There is no way you've got a tiny bit of data, and you have a huge domain, okay? Which is why most of your traditional uh, machine learning is just thrown out the door, right? We always deal with things that are simple and a toy, but when it comes to real problems, none of that stuff goes through the door, okay? So uh, we have a very big problem, right? We can't generalize, right? We can't generalize. So what we want to do is use the idea of function approximation, right? Instead of being able to calculate the probability of all of these images, okay, what we're going to do is calculate the probability of functions that can generate those images. How do we do that, right? So we're going to store a parameterized function, right? We're going to learn a model which has some weights, beta, and those betas will be able then to generate the probability of x, rather than me trying to figure out what the probability of x is. I'm going to generate a system to do that. Okay, so that's what we said here, right? We're going to do function approximation as a result of having this big problem with uh, the sample size being way, way, way too small compared to the type of data that you're trying to, to sample from or, or create, right? We're going to learn uh, a way such that uh, given this particular model, it will try to approximate as best as it can uh, the actual probability of that sample against the actual data, right? That's what this says, right? Okay. Now, the key problem that we saw on the last slide at the bottom here, okay, is that, um, okay, let me erase all of this. I can't figure out how to do this better, faster. Okay, um, can I erase the whole slide? Okay. okay, well, I will figure it out eventually. Okay, the important thing is this part here, okay? It says each in image influences only one parameter. So what we want to do is when we create a, a, a model for this, we want to have the parameters influence many things at once, okay? It's the only way that we can get something that can reliably generalize. Okay, so this is what we mean by the complex joint distribution over X. All right, we've got all of these images, but a lot of the pixels in an image are conditional on other pixels in the image, right? If I look at two neighboring pixels, right, their values are not going to be very different from each other most of the time, right? I see a black pixel, the neighboring pixels are probably gonna be black, right? But the way we've represented the data set doesn't carry any of those regularities, right? We look at random noise, the next pixel could be whatever color it wants to be, right? So we're not taking any of this structure into account. That's what we want to do by creating a model that's parameterized in such a way it can influence a lot of things at the same time, okay? So we want to do that by thinking about the model design and the training procedure, okay? So what are we gonna do? We wanna fit a distribution, right? The distribution is the data, okay? And we want to uh, find uh, a model class that can minimize the loss of fidelity in the probability distribution fit, right? Okay, so I have a probability distribution from the actual data samples, okay? And I have a probability distribution that I've learned to generate by creating this model parameterized by theta, okay? So I create this model, it has some parameters theta, and then when I give it Xs, it'll say, oh, you know, that image has a likelihood of 0 0.00009, okay? Or that one has a probability of 0 0 0 1, okay? And what I want to do is take those probabilities and compare them with the original probabilities, right? 
So that, that means I'm going to take this loss function, right? For all the particular data samples, for example, image one through image n, okay? I'm going to try to find how different is the probability distribution from each other, okay? If I give it a random noise image, and I was trained on, uh, you know, CFAR 10 data, then it should pro probably calculate a very low probability, right? To get a picture of a car, probably it calculates a higher probability, okay? And that's going to be how I'm going to drive the training of this model that is going to create the probability distribution, okay? Everyone follow that? So there's an abstraction here. I'm not doing the probability distribution myself anymore, right? I'm training a system, a neural network, if you will, to output the probability distribution, okay? And how I'm gonna train that model is by this loss, right? It's just saying that, you know, if I have two neural networks with different parameters, okay, I'm gonna favor the one that has more fidelity to the underlying data distribution, and I'm gonna go that direction, okay? And we all know how to do that. Hopefully you're familiar with stochastic gradient descent, right? It's the key algorithm that we use for training neural networks. It's just basically saying, you know, if I have a loss function like this, okay, I can calculate the gradient of which way that I can change my parameters such that the loss gets lower and lower and lower. Right? That's all, right? So I keep on generating uh, uh, new neural networks that are trained slightly differently in such that a way that I can minimize this loss. So I can get fidelity between my actual data distribution and the data distribution that's predicted by the neural network. Okay, everyone following that? Any discussion or points that you want to bring up? Questions? Okay, so again, when we are trying to do this type of neural network or any type of model computation, this is a very important point. Okay, this part down here, right? Let me move that up a little bit so you guys can see that, okay? We don't want the training procedure to generate back the same data distribution. We want it to generalize, right? So for example, when I give it uh, pictures of images, right? And I sample from that, I want to be able to sample new images that's not seen before, okay? If I only memorize the data and I can only return samples that I've actually seen, it's not, doing the job that I've assigned it to do, which is to generalize from the data. It's only memorize the data, okay? So what I want to do is not reproduce the empirical data distribution, okay? That's the data distribution of things that I've actually given, all the X's that are in my training data. I wanted to be able to say, you know, this image that's a deep fake, it's actually quite likely, okay? You know, this, this, picture of Trump where he's you know, saying nasty things, that's very likely, you know? Okay, maybe it didn't actually happen, but who cares? It's, it's a deep fake or uh, uh, images that I'm drawing out from this underlying distribution, okay? So when we come back to uh, this, this picture here, right? What we want to do is when we learn a distribution, we want it to be smooth, right? because then I can get probabilities for data points that I've not seen before, right? It's not a step function. Okay. So the way that we can do this is using maximum likelihood, right? This is a technique that you should all know, right? It's just an optimization uh, procedure that says given some data set where I have X's, all these data points or images or, or poems or whatever, okay? I'm gonna compute um, a way of uh, training the model, right? I have my probability of the model outputting for a particular uh, data sample. And I'm gonna go through all of the data points in my data set and then accumulate that and get a value, right? So basically saying, what's the likelihood of um, the current data given the model, right? So I'm going to keep on iterating this in such a way that I'm going to try to take my parameters and change them 
so that the likelihood that the data is getting better and better. All right. So uh, you can listen to the lecture more about this. I, I'm not going to go over it that much, but you can say that this is actually equivalent to uh, minimizing the KL divergence. So KL divergence, uh, who knows about this? KL divergence? Anyone want to explain what KL divergence is so that everyone else knows? Okay, so you know what we mean by that is, let's say, if I have two dis distributions like this one here and this one here, okay, I'm basically computing how different these two distributions are. Okay, one thing you need to know about KL divergence is it's asymmetric, which means whichever one that you uh, think of as a source, um, it will compute a different value from if it was done in the opposite way. Okay, so. Um, Usually when you think about a distribution similarity or dissimilarity function, it wouldn't matter which one comes first, right? You just say how much mass in my probability needs to be moved from one part to another part of the distribution. And you can think of other ways to do that. There's uh, something called earth movers, this can be also done sometimes. Okay, but KL divergence has a, a, a very nice basis for um, a mathematical basis for this. And we can say that doing something like maximum likelihood is trying to do this, right? So why is that important? We said we wanted to try to um, get a model that generates the same data distribution as in the sample, right? So we want the model to be able to replicate that. And so we're going to use the casting gradient descent and maximum log likelihood to try to move our neural network to have parameters that's going to create the same data distribution as in the data set, that's all. Okay. Okay. So um, again, there are many techniques for doing this. You can learn them in other places, but basically right now we're at some golden state where uh, a lot of things have come together to make certain things more feasible. What I mean by that is now we have neural networks, we have stochastic gradient descent. Those things have been known for a very long time, but now we have the underlying hardware such as GPU and uh, parallel computation that allows very efficient computation of these things, okay? So because of that, we can use these ultra simple algorithms, okay, to, to, to do this type of uh, optimization very quickly, okay? So when we have a function that's differentiable, okay, then we can use stochastic gradient descent to uh, optimize, okay? Do we, need to cover, maybe we should uh, ask you guys a little bit, how does stochastic gradient descent work to try to optimize a differential function? So for those of you in the DYC class, hopefully you know this, but if you don't, this is a very key point, right, for understanding how neural networks work. Yeah. yeah. So um, basically, what how gradient descents are optimized the uh, not minimizing the loss function is that what it will do is that it will basically uh, the analogy of the physical analogy of it will be like rolling down some kind of hill. So the loss function you imagine is some kind of hill, and all it does is roll uh, the it rolls down. In other words, it goes the position it goes opposite of the gradients. So by going opposite of the gradient, what happens is that you, in the process, you actually uh, minimize, you find the parameters that minimize the loss function. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna draw that for you. Let's say I have a certain parameter, let's call it beta one, okay? So it's one way. Ah, oh, okay, sorry. Thank you. So let's say I have some parameter theta one, okay? This theta one is uh, some coefficient that goes between zero and one, okay? So I can set it at whatever value I want, okay? And what I'm going to do is just measure how bad my loss is, okay? Some, some, some uh, uh, measure of how good uh, I'm doing, okay? Against different settings of this parameter, right? 
So let's say I'm currently at this value here. Maybe this is 0.7 or something like that. So I've set this uh, beta one to 0.7. I get this particular loss value, okay, over here. Okay, but I want to do better because loss is bad, right? So I want to optimize it for something. Okay. Now if f is a differential function, just like Liang Ming said, I can compute its derivative, right? So the derivative is going to be something like that, right? And then I can know from this derivative which way is optimizing the loss, right? Because the derivative is going to point in the positive direction. So I want to go in the direction of the negative of the gradient, right? The gradient and the derivative are the same thing. It's just the gradient is sort of a multivariate version of a uh, derivative, right? So you can say instead of having just x uh, theta 1 here, I have theta 1 through theta 256 or uh, theta 50,000. So I have 50,000 of these parameters. They all are in some type of uh, differentiable function that I have. So for each of these dimensions, I'm doing this type of calculation. Okay, so I found a gradient here. That means if I change my parameter value from 0.7 downward to 0.6 or something, oh, I'm gonna get a worse loss, right? My loss is gonna go up. This, this delta here, it went up, bad, okay? Instead, I want to go down. I want to go the other direction, right? Maybe I, I go down. So I step in this direction and I, I change it to maybe 0.8. Okay. Oh, that looks a lot better. I got this loss here. Okay. So that's all the gradient descent is doing. It's just a basic method to calculate a gradient on a differentiable function. And that difference, uh, that gradient or that direction, tells us which way we should set our parameters. Basically, for this particular theta one, it says, go increase it, okay? And I'm doing this for all the dimensions on my model. And then I can say, okay, for uh, uh, dimension 49, increase it, for dimension 50, decrease it a little bit, et cetera. Okay, that's all, okay? So uh, we're basically doing this, right? Um, we're choosing to use both of these together, right? Maximum likelihood to compute the probability of a, a data point, and therefore, when we generalize it, the data distribution, okay? The stochastic gradient descent to be able to train a model to do these probability predictions, okay? <clears throat> yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, what is the loss function? Can anyone tell me what is the loss function? Because we, typically we think about loss function for supervised learning, right? So it's clear what that means, right? Because we want to get classification accuracy. What does it mean for a loss function to be in a supervised case? Can you give more points to the loss function? So, uh, yeah, thanks. So, uh, if you look over there, right, you will see that if you apply Let's try to work it from ground up because I think a lot of you are like sort of lost. Is that true? Okay. So um, let's see. How do we get to the whiteboard? Uh, never mind. Okay. So um, basically, do you remember we had the CDF that we talked about before? Does everyone understand the CDF that we were talking about when we drew something like that? Right. So this CDF is a cumulative distribution function over all the possible x's, right? So when we say, for example, images, all the possible images, okay? 
this CDF has this particular form, right? And if we take any CDF, it's going to be some variant of that. So here's another CDF. Here's another CDF. Okay. Sorry, this is not a CDF. I have to make the dependence of one, right? So those are all different cumulative probability distributions over the entire data set. Like this one, this one over here says, well, all of these images over here are not likely, but this the, the set of images here are very, very likely. Okay. So one of these CDFs, let's say the red one, is the one that we actually saw in our data set. Okay. And what we want to do is have a model that creates a CDF as close as possible to this one. Okay, does that make sense? So when we create a neural network that's going to output probabilities, it can output any probabilities that it wants, but again, over all the images, it must satisfy this cumulative distribution function. It must put out a CDF. Okay, so maybe when we start the neural network, we create it, initialize it, we're going to get one of these uh, things. Maybe we get one like this one, okay, like this one. Maybe it starts out like that, okay? And then the loss function that we're trying to calculate here is the fidelity between the, uh, this CDF of the actual data distribution or CDF of the model, okay? So I'm gonna draw that for you. This is the loss. Okay, does that make sense now? Okay, because that is the gap between the probability of me, my model, predicting the likelihood of certain data points and the actual likelihood given in the data. Okay? Just like if I were to think about, you know, having a fair die and a biased die, okay? If I have a model that says, oh, your, uh, uh, my a model of my die says six is a very likely, one to five is never likely, but I have a fair die, then we would say that distribution doesn't really match very well. Okay, so what we mean by KL divergence and log likelihood is just to measure that amount of discrepancy between my model that's generating this probability distribution and the actual data distribution. Okay, so what I'm going to do is try to minimize this. I'm going to try to shrink it. Okay, and how I do that is very simple, right? Uh, okay. I'm going to try to use uh, stochastic gradient descent because what I'm going to learn is a differentiable function. And it's just going to try to move my model closer and closer and closer until I get right on top, okay? When I get right on top, the difference between my actual data distribution and the model will be zero, right? And then I'll have no loss, okay? That's the goal. Right, we want to reproduce the data distribution. All right, everyone happy with that? When we're in the middle of training this network, okay, let's say, um, again, where we saw here. <clears throat> let's say I'm here, okay, and let's say the, the actual CDF of the data is here, okay, then all of the space in this purple section is my loss, right? So I, I'm measuring that, I'm computing that loss, okay, this colored space, that has a value. That value is what I'm measuring on this axis here, which says loss, okay? And as I calculate the gradient of how my loss will vary according to the parameters in my model, right? This function uh, beta one, some tuning parameter that I have, I can say, oh, when I change my parameter either in a positive or a negative direction, I will change the loss. That means that that uh, physical area in the CDF, okay, is either gonna grow bigger or smaller, okay? I'm measuring that, and I'm using that to set a new value for this parameter, okay? Everyone happy? I know it's late. Many of you haven't had dinner, you're like, too much. I'm sorry. I'm going home. Yeah. So just now the red one is the probability of the data. This one. Yes. Yeah. That's the right. The purple one would not be the probability of the data, but the probability of the data with the The purple is 
indicative of how well the probability distribution from the data, which is the red one, okay, and I know, I know how the idea. model is currently thinking about the data, which is the blue one, okay. okay. Yeah. So the blue one is the one that is uh, parameterized times the data. Yes. It's basically the neural network that we're going to train that is trying to spit out probabilities for each data point, okay? So you can ask it about any data point, right? These are all data points on my X, right? They're all data points. So I can pick any X, say, how likely is it, okay? Then the model will say, oh, point blah, 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 right? And then what we want to do is say, oh, well, check it against the actual distribution. Oh, you got it wrong by this much, okay? So that's going to be a piece of my loss, okay? That's what it says here, okay? This says for each data point in my data set, all one through M images or texts, okay? I'm gonna calculate the log likelihood, right? Log likelihood of that data point, right? And I'm going to see how bad that is compared to the log likelihood in the original data set, okay? So that is measuring when I uh, sum all of these together, right? Because this is a discrete place, it's just a summation. If it's continuous, you would have an integration sign, right? Okay, when I sum all of these together, I'll get some scalar value, right? That scalar value is basically representing this uh, purple wedge, right? This, I don't know what, what that is. <laughs> Banana, okay. So is it right that the magic here is that you don't need to know the red line because you're just trying to sum and minimize you do need to know the red line because the red line is from the underlying data distribution, right? This is the data that you are given, right? So I give you a sample of data, right? I need to know what likelihood is that sample, right? That's this red red area here. Okay. But the loss isn't concerned about that. When you just sum the parameterized part of the group. Right. So, uh, so that our like final aim is to uh, make our model like the distribution of the data, right? Like the yes. Data. So would that be all of the things? Like uh, since in supervised learning, if we uh, like learn the data distribution in the exact manner, that we call all of the things that we're doing. But in this case, is that like the really the final aim, or uh, would that still be considered as all of Okay, so this is a good point. Everyone know what overfitting is. Okay, that, that should be something that everyone in machine learning is familiar with. Okay, so overfitting means that we are only understanding the training data, but we have no way of generalizing from the model to represent testing data, unseen data. Okay, so in the case where we actually represent the data exactly, through the step function, we're overfitting. We won't be able to generate new data, okay? So yes, in some ways, okay? So we don't want to generate exactly the same data points that are in our distribution. We want it to match the distribution, but do it in such a way that I can get new data points out, okay? So I want to be, uh, and, and that's a function of the way we construct our model, okay? Remember that because the data set is so vast, in order for us to compute a small enough model, we have to use very small number of parameters, right? So these parameters that we set, let's say for example, this beta one here, should influence a lot of different things. It might actually, depending on how I set this value, change pixel values all over the image, okay? So, yeah. I have a question, I think there is some misunderstanding. Go back. We really don't know the distribution of the image. And suppose I give you just 10 images, then we don't know really the, the true distribution of uh, all the image space, right? What we are trying to do there is we basically pass, we have this whole neural net and I pass each image and then uh, that uh, neural net spits out the probability of the image based on how we construct that image. Yeah. And then you have 10 such probabilities, right? Yes. Now we have this 10 probabilities based on whatever the initial uh, configuration of the neural net, and then we keep running SDB till such time that some of those 10 probabilities maximum. Yeah. Because then that tells you that for given a, a particular configuration of the neural net, 
you are maximizing the probability of observing just this kind of data. That's right. But that's essentially because there is no way we'll ever know the PX data. Yes. We probably need to know the entire population. You are right. So this gets back to uh, the main So you question. never need to know that. That's why in that formula you don't see the PX data. It appears as a sample mix type, which is the input image. And if you have, the more images you have, probably the better. Because ultimately our objective is to learn about the PX data. That's what we want to understand. Right. Did everyone got get that? Okay, so we, we, we don't actually have this red line that I've drawn over here, right? We just have samples of that red line. We have particular data points on it, right? And uh, the point is, uh, as, uh, sorry, I didn't get your name again. Parda. Parda. Parda said is we want to maximize the log likelihood of those particular data points, right? We want to get everything in this red box, which we drew before, okay, to be likely, all right? I think that's a better way of phrasing it. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go ahead? I was going to say that the true distribution is something we never actually know. The red line, you can call the red line the distribution of the samples of the data. It can be like a sample of like influence, which is why it's called the other piece that they are a lot of the sample data that are represented in other pieces. Right. So uh, again, because the data size is so big, right, our X domain is all possible images. So there's no way we can know the true distribution, right? We just have some samples of it, right? And from those samples, we can calculate a loss, right? To say that for those samples, we want to know that they're likely to be generated by our model. Okay. So that, that, that's exactly explaining what this log likelihood is there. For all the samples that we have in our data, we want them to be likely to be creatable from our model. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Okay. Thanks for all of your help. Okay. So um, again, one thing that we want to do is uh, figure out what types of parameters that we want to create in a model, right? Let's say we have a parameter for each pixel, okay, in an image, okay? But that wouldn't be a very good way to set up the parameterization. Why? Because if we do that, each, in, uh, each parameter doesn't influence any of the other neighboring pixels, right? Right. So we want to set our parameters in such a way that it represents like the types of constraints that we actually see in real life, right? So for example, in images, when we set a parameter, maybe that parameter influences more than one pixel at a time, okay? Maybe it's going to influence a neighborhood of pixels all to be changing color in the same direction. Okay, that would be much more natural, okay? So instead of having a parameter for each pixel, maybe I'm gonna have a parameter for part patches of pixels or uh, things of that sort, okay? So what we want to do is find some way of setting up what is the structure of our model, okay? So one way we can do this is uh, using BayesNet. Who here has learned BayesNet already? Yeah, some of you. Okay, good. A couple of you. All right. So, what's a base net? Can anyone tell me? Eugene, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, just to paraphrase, uh, you know, it's a conditional uh, model, right? It's a graphical model that illustrates the dependence between variables, right? So here we have a, a, a base net, okay? And you can understand this as having a directions, right? So we have a random variable B. Once I've determined this variable, because it doesn't have any incoming arrows except for the one that I've drawn, right? So you know that one, okay? Basically, once I've determined a, a value of B, I can use that B to determine uh, the value of A in part, right? 
So I can say A is actually dependent on both uh, B and E, right? And so once I have A, for example, once I've determined A, it can help me determine the value of J. Okay? So this is just the structure of, of a, a conditional probabilistic model, right? How is that related to what we're talking about? Well, we want to structure the parameters in such a way that we can influence uh, neighboring things, right? So we can say, for example, if I have a model that says, okay, for example, um, there are faces in this picture, okay, then maybe if that is variable B, then there is some likelihood that faces correspond to bodies, okay? So I can say that if I have a parameter that determines the spaces, it's likely that, that, that whatever setting of that is there, it helps me to determine how many bodies there are. Right now, yes, right, because we're dealing with, I think here, just um, uh, Boolean variables. Yeah. Uh, as for the probability, Uh, they can be from anywhere. Yeah, they could be from observed probabilities. They could be from, from anywhere. Right. Yeah, good point. Right. The important thing we want to get out of this discussion is not to go over base that so much, but to say that there's uh, an abstraction that we want to enforce when we come up with a parameterized model. Okay. So when we come up with a parameterized model with beta 1 through beta n, we want them to be in some type of conditional probability uh, dependence, okay? We're not gonna say all of these variables are independent of each other, right? So I gave you the example before that, you know, pixel one has a, a parameter associated with it, pixel two has a parameter associated with it, but never will the two meet, right? That wouldn't help, right? Instead, because we have these regularities of images, right? We want to use those for some help, right? So I'm going to say that if I determine pixel one's color, that somehow there's some conditional probability that that pixel's influence will extend to pixel number two, right? So I'm going to create a graphical model of how these, uh, all of these parameters influence each other. Okay, so that's what a, a base net is. So autoregressive model is uh, starting uh, around this idea, right? So the idea is that you first create a base net structure, which is just saying uh, which variables are conditioned on each other, okay? And then after that, uh, you can use this to do maximum likelihood uh, training. Because now we have uh, the parameters and we can know how they relate to each other. Okay, so I determined the uh, parameter value for one. Um, sorry, I uh, determined the value of a parameter in one place. Then that's going to influence the likelihood of another parameter's value. Right. So I, I basically am going to uh, calculate a topological ordering of all the variables in my base net. Okay, starting with ones that don't have any parents. So let me go back here. So I have to go uh, start from here, right from the top. Okay, determine the value for this one and for this one. And then because these are, con uh, A is conditionally de de dependent on B and E, then after I've determined these two values, I can determine the value for A. And after I've determined the value for A, I don't need either B or E to determine the value of J and for M. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. Okay. And so uh, if I give this structure and I train it, this becomes what's known as an autoregressive model, which is the ones, uh, one of the ones that we're going to be covering quite a lot in depth uh, in this course, okay? Right, so how do we actually build a, an autoregressive model? Maybe we'll finish after this slide or so, okay? So we're going to say maybe, for example, I have two variables, x1 and x2, right? And I want to create a model, right? This model that's going to give me uh, a probability of seeing a particular combination of x1 and x2's value, right? So you can think of this as maybe a, an image with just two pixels, okay? If you will. 
Okay. So when I create a base net for this, basically I'm going to say, for example, that pixel one is independent of anything, and then pixel two is dependent on pixel one's color. Okay. So um, I've decomposed this model, this joint model of x1 comma x2, factorized it into an unconditional probability of the first pixel and a conditional probability the color of the second pixel based on whatever we decided for the first pixel. Okay. Okay. So how do we start? Well, for uh, variables that are not conditioned on anything, we have to start from somewhere. So we're going to sample it from a distribution. Okay, some histogram. Okay. I could sample it from a normal distribution. I could sample from a uniform distribution. If I didn't know any better, I make the least assumptions and I sample from a uniform distribution. Okay. So once I've determined the value for a pixel one, then I'm going to train a model, okay, to output the probability of the second pixel. Okay. How do I do that? I train a neural network. Okay. I uh, train a MLP, a multi-layer perceptron to that. Okay, so this multi-layer perceptron has an input at the bottom, right? X1 goes through a bunch of layers right, if we need to and outputs X2, right? So that could be logic followed by a softmax. The softmax is actually calculating what value you put out of it. Okay. If you're not clear about what this means, that means uh, we can spend some more time talking about how a neural network right basically we're saying that we have some variable here which is going to be my value of x1 okay and it's being fed into some neural network okay and then output at the end some value of x2 okay that's all okay so um, yeah, I don't remember what this slide was about. Okay, just, just to say that uh, when we have high dimensional data, we have a lot of parameters. So um, we have to worry about the cases where we have uh, long data, for example, in text generation. I'm gonna skip this bit, okay? But I wanna cover what, what we mean by what we're doing, okay? So let's say I want to generate a, a string of text. One way to do it is using a recurrent neural network. Everyone familiar with recurrent neural network? All right, it looks like this, all right? So basically what we have here are inputs, right? I have an input. That input gets pushed into an embedding structure, something like this, which is basically saying, okay, the representation of H, in this case a character, is in some type of uh, vector notation, okay? Then I run it through a, a neural network. This is my neural network here, okay? And then out of that neural network, it's going to have at the output layer some probability prediction of a certain output. So for example, after I run the neural network with input H, it outputs the letter E because the second element is most likely from my softmax. Okay, everyone all right with that? Okay. And then what I'm going to do is because this is a BayesNet structure, okay, something like that in, in the uh, uh, RNN style, okay, I'm gonna take the in output of X2. Remember, this is my X1. I generated X2 by going through my neural network. Okay, my X2 is now input here. Okay, so here's X2. Okay, I feed it in. It goes through another neural network. What happens here? Anyways, oh, it goes through a neural network, maybe with the same parameters. Okay, an RNN, as you probably know keeps the same parameters for every time step. So all of these uh, uh, hidden layers here represent the same neural network, the same number of parameters, same setting for all the parameters, right? And I create X3, right? Then I take X3 as input, feed it through the neural network, get X4, X4, and then create X5. 
right? And at the end, I've generated the data that I want to get, right? So you can think about this in a, um, a pixel setting. So if I wanted to create an entire image, I would assemble it one pixel at a time. So X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. It's one way to do it, not the right way, but one, yeah. Sir. Yeah. This green number at the top here? It's three if it is an error. Yeah, so these are supposed to be soft max, so this should be the maximum value of each one. But there it should be one point. Yeah, maybe this should be something higher. Yeah, it's supposed to be the highest max, right? Yes, when you do soft max, it's always the highest max. That's the idea. Okay. So the RNN is something similar to what we want to do. It's not exactly what we want to do, but it's similar to that. Okay. So um, when you have an autoregressive model, sometimes you want to be able to do something like what the RNN is doing or using a CNN. Okay, we'll talk about that another day. But the important part about uh, what you've just seen here is that you can see there's a serial dependency. What do we mean by that? If I want to calculate, for example, this x5 here, how do I do that? I can't get to it right away. It depends on x4. How did I get x4? I can't get it directly. I have to depend on x3, right? So to get to x5, I have to do all the calculations for one, two, three, four, and then get five, right? So that's a problem because, you know, in order to assemble the entire image, you know, you have to sample each and each pixel all the way down, right? So one way to get this done faster is to try to parallelize computation. Okay, right? We want to be able to predict all of these in, in tandem. Okay? So we're going to uh, come up with the idea of a mass multi uh, layer perceptron. Okay, and um, you guys can look this up in Slack or, or something like this. Uh, look up the paper that they're referencing made. Okay, you can, if you have a chance, you can share it on Slack. How are we doing on time? We're over time, is it? I'm completely lost. Okay, so I think we're going to end there. All right, sorry about that. The clock there is accurate, but all the clocks I have are in different time zones. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so um, next lecture, those of you responsible for lecture two, you can start around here, okay, on uh, the mass auto encoder, and we'll just proceed from there. Okay? Yes, Eugene. Yeah, so anyone assigned to week two, please stay back so that uh, they can talk together. Okay, I'm sorry again, I haven't finished uh, putting everyone into the uh, worksheet, but I will try to do that very soon. Okay, and that'll be it for tonight. Thank you.